Whether it's a musical masterpiece or a beautifully crafted object, art and design is a human experience that almost everyone can appreciate. It has the power to invigorate you, reawaken dormant memories, or simply improve your quality of life. And this is exactly how artists and designers feel when their work isn't recognized. It takes time, effort, and a great deal of trial and error for creative people to make beautiful work. And it can be really discouraging when nobody cares about it. All of these creative achievements are nothing short of magic. These are all well-known masterpieces, but there are tens of thousands of other brilliant creative works that will never be heard, seen, or recognized. Why is there such a disparity between the creative cultural icons of our time and the artists and designers who are just as talented but remain overlooked? Why doesn't society value creativity? Creative people are some of the most mocked and disdained people in society, but also some of the most respected and celebrated. All at the same time, our lives are significantly improved because of creative work. In this video, we'll cover the problems of creativity and I'll tell you about some of the solutions that I've had success with. I'm not a world famous designer or anything, but I am able to pick the types of clients that I wanna work with, which is something that most creative people would be pretty happy with. The average person simply doesn't understand the amount of thought and consideration that goes into a creative masterpiece. This is David. It's an iconic and world-renowned sculpture made by Michelangelo. If you look at David's eyes up close, you'll notice that each eye is looking in two slightly different directions. His pupils are also hollowed out so that they cast darker shadows. This is not an accident. These visual tricks help to make David stare look intense and alive. It looks a bit weird when you're zoomed in like this, but Michelangelo knew that people would be looking at the statue from a distance, and he took that into consideration. There are literally thousands of decisions like this made in every great creative work, whether it's a beautiful car design or a great piece of music or a beautiful sculpture. This is true mastery, but most people don't notice these nuances because they just don't care. In the modern world, convenience is king. The less we understand and the less we have to think, the more successful we are. If someone drives for us, we don't have to think about driving anymore, that's considered success. If someone cleans our house for us, that's success. If we don't have to think about the small details of our lives, that is the ultimate measure of success in the modern world. As a designer myself, pretty much my entire job is centered around not making you have to think when you're using a product that I make for you. All we care about is output and how it benefits us. And we're all the same, including you and me. We mindlessly scroll through Instagram and other social media sites and see amazing acts of skill and talent without even giving them two seconds of thought. When was the last time you actually sat down to watch movie credits roll through? Did you ever look at the visual effects teams? Did you ever look to see who that obscure actor was who had the little tiny role? You probably almost never do. None of us care because it's far easier to consume creative works than it is to reflect on them. But in the case of movies, at least the person is credited. In most cases, the designer or creator is never credited for their work. Nobody knows the people behind the original iPhone, for example. I mean, sure, you might know Steve Jobs or the head designer Johnny Ive, but what about the rest of the geniuses who made it happen? Speaking of geniuses, here are a couple of people who helped me make this video. Maybe you'll actually read through it this time, but I wouldn't blame you if you don't. And I'm not blaming anyone for this. The modern world is incredibly overwhelming, and we'd all go insane if we had to try and understand the nuance of every detail of everything. But it is a major reason why creative pursuits just aren't valued. It just takes too much time and effort and it doesn't directly impact us. Our emphasis on convenience hides the inner workings of something and we're actively discouraged from truly understanding and therefore appreciating great creative works. I think you can start to see how the details behind David's stare suddenly isn't really that valued to any of us. Those details are fundamental to creative work, but ultimately don't matter to us. And it bleeds into other aspects of creative production. Probably most importantly, creative pursuits are judged based on scale rather than quality or merit. Most of us don't know how to evaluate creative pursuits in any sort of conceptual, philosophical, or craftsmanship level. So we really only focus on two things, how much money it made and how many people know about it. Creativity can't be easily measured in any other way, and that's a big problem in commercial or corporate contexts. Even creatives themselves don't always know what's good or bad. There's the constant issue of never knowing if your work is actually good. There's a phenomenon known as the Ikea effect where 
people are willing to spend 63% more on Ikea furniture that they assembled themselves. Even if it's built the wrong way, we tend to love our own ideas more than other people's ideas. So it makes it really hard to evaluate the quality of your own work. I might consider this a spectacular masterpiece because my friend Jack and I made it when we were kids, but I'm not sure how much it's really worth to anybody else. With most other professional fields, you're solving a concrete problem. With design or art, that can be the case, but not always. There are lots of intangibles. Any new idea that you present, whether it's revolutionary or terrible, is going to get the same reaction, ridicule. Our default response to anything new that we don't know how to respond to is to mock it. It's so difficult to tell whether you're onto something big or you're wasting your time, which is a real issue with radical creative works. Even the iPhone, one of the most iconic product designs of our time, was never a guaranteed success. It's easy to look back on the original iPhone now and see why it would be successful, but it wasn't so clear when it first launched. $500? That is the most expensive phone in the world, and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard. It's likely that we'd value creativity and craftsmanship as a society if we were actually encouraged to understand it. It's not that surprising that creativity isn't valued, but it actually gets even more complicated. Solving an open-ended design problem or coming up with an artistic masterpiece is like trying to solve a puzzle, except all of the puzzle pieces are black. The puzzle has no beginning or end, and some of the pieces that are critically important to seeing the whole picture are hidden in weird places. Some are in couch cushions, some of the pieces are up in a tree, others are down by the beach. It's incredibly inefficient and slow and laborious. Creativity is really disorganized and non-linear. This is the absolute opposite of the way that successful businesses run. Businesses rely on organization and order. Like I said before, the biggest measure of success for creative work in modern society is around how much money it makes or how well known it is. Creativity is incredibly difficult to make profitable because it's so unpredictable. Even if you do find that perfect design concept, the people commissioning your work will usually reject it. Mike in business development says it's an unproven idea. Karen from marketing says there's not enough sales data on it. It's not that they have bad intentions, it's just that they have different interests that are centered around making the company money in the safest way possible. So when a creative person person sees a groundbreaking and novel idea, the administrators in the company just see a risky, unproven thread. But the thing is, great design and art is inherently polarizing. If everyone likes the work, it's probably not very good. When Michelangelo presented The Last Judgment, it was criticized for being too violent and having too much nudity. Michelangelo depicts himself right here. This sagging, deformed body is his self-portrait, and it represents the contempt he had for the patrons who commissioned him to do the work. This is pretty much exactly how I feel when I'm working with a really difficult client. And you can't blame the patrons and business people of the world, really. I mean, I know it's cool and edgy to say you wanna disrupt the status quo or whatever, but you're not gonna make friends by telling people that the thing that they've been doing with great success for 50 years is dumb. I mean, it's just not gonna go well. An unproven idea is really, really risky. You can be cautious or you can be creative, but there's no such thing as a cautious creative. Failure is a huge part of creativity, but it's just not something that's tolerated in commercial settings. If you're a designer or an artist, think about how many ideas you come up with in a year that never actually make it past the concept phase. Thousands of thumbnail concepts and quick sketches or initial ideas get tossed in the garbage in search of something better. From a business standpoint, all of these early ideas are just inefficient failures, but from a creative standpoint, they are absolutely essential to getting to the final product. Because failure isn't really tolerated in commercial contexts, fear of failure tends to paralyze us all. And it's pretty much impossible to be creative if you're nervous or anxious. In fact, monetary incentives tend to be bad for coming up with creative ideas. According to 51 studies analyzed by the London School of Economics, financial incentives can result in a negative impact on overall performance. If you wanna kill creativity, give people a reward for doing well. That's why it's been said that the Nobel prize is the tombstone on all great creative work. So before I talk my way out of ever getting hired for design consulting work again, I do want to mention that you can employ processes and systems for design work to reduce risk. A lot of commercial creative work is done within the confines of a company's process, while showing little bits of risk here and there so you don't blow up the whole damn building. Most of my paid consulting work is centered around doing that. But at that point, I mean, is it really creative? In some ways, yes. I mean, I guess setting up new processes can be creative in its own way, but it's not likely to yield 
revolutionary results. It's more likely to yield incremental improvements, which in all honesty is usually what companies are after anyway. Most people who work as designers are actually just following a very constrained process to create somewhat predictable proven results. Young designers and artists focus pretty much all of their time on improving their craft rather than understanding how businesses operate. So most of my time in design school was spent learning how to draw and make models rather than learning about how design fits into a larger business context. The main thing that gets me or you or any creative hired is their experience and expertise. But knowledge and experience is the enemy of creativity because you're already making many assumptions about how the project should work. It keeps us from seeing other decisions because we just go to the proven thing that worked in the past. Now, there's nothing wrong with this. I do this professionally all the time. This is the logical path if you're trying to be efficient after all. But I would argue that it's not very creative. The bottom line is that most professional work is about the bottom line. Are you making the company more money? If the answer is yes, figure out how to make a process out of it and do it over and over again. If not, you're fired. <laughs> So brutal, but it's true. Companies and society say that they value innovation or divergent thinking, and companies may even have innovation programs, but very few of them will ever go through the insane risk of going past the idea phase. This is why most revolutionary creative work is done by people with nothing to lose. They're also usually outsiders. For example, Apple created the iPod after narrowly escaping bankruptcy. The movie Rocky was Sylvester Stallone's last ditch effort to make it as a writer and an actor. Coco Chanel, Louis Vuitton, Kanye West, and many other rappers, every single one of these creative powerhouses started with no money, no prospects, and nothing to lose. I mean, sure, look, there's plenty of spectacular creative work out there that was made by people who weren't desperate, but most people won't take that leap if they're already comfortable. Even if you do make a successful creative work, that's all people are gonna wanna see. That's why there's like seven Rocky movies or whatever at this point. Yo, Adrian, yo, Adrian, yo, Adrian. Yo, Adrian. Yo, Adrian. Hey, Adrian. Adrian. Imagine if Sylvester Stallone tried to do a completely different style of film. Everyone would either ignore it or just be annoyed by it. Once people sort of see you as the guy who plays Rocky or Rambo, that's what they expect from you. It's not just external pressure either. Once you start to identify with a certain style or category, you kind of want to stick to it. Rodney Mullen, for example, he's one of the most creative skateboarders to ever live. He invented dozens of tricks and he changed the way we approach the craft forever. He won 35 out of 36 contests over 11 years. Winning isn't the word I want at once. The rest of the time you're just defending and you get into this like turtle posture, you know? Well, you're not doing it. It usurped the joy of what I love to do because I was no longer doing it to create and have fun. And when it died out from under me, that was one of the most liberating things because I could create. Once these people have something to lose, they slip into comfort and stop innovating. It's what their audience wants and it's the safe bet for them. Success and recognition can destroy your creativity. And I don't really blame any creative people for going this route. I mean, I even do this a lot in my own work. After working so hard and finally striking gold, it can be really tough to just walk away from a successful formula. I know I might sound like a real pessimist right now. There is a silver lining to all this, but in order to come up with a solution, you have to fully understand the problem. Creativity not being valued is not just society's fault. There's a dark side to creative industries, and creative people are often their own worst enemy. First, I wanna talk about Milanote. They're today's sponsor, and it's a great tool for organizing creative projects. As I've mentioned throughout this video, creativity can be really messy and chaotic. Milanote is a tool that I use to organize my thoughts when doing creative projects. When I'm ready, I can share the board with other people and team members and clients, and they can actually add feedback and we can collaborate more quickly. It's basically like the walls of a creative studio where everyone hangs up their work, except it can be viewed from anywhere in the world. It's really easy to start a project because there are over a hundred built-in templates available for designers, photographers, filmmakers, and artists. I actually use Milanote to organize some ideas that I had when making this video. I have a to-do list, title and thumbnail ideas, as well as inspiration images and videos, and all of this helps me to get my creative projects done in an organized way. I've also used Milanote on other client-based design projects with great results. Milanote is available for free with no time limit. Sign up using the link in the description below and start your next creative project using Milanote.
Okay, so back to the video. First of all, creators are just not very good at negotiation because we put so much of ourselves into our work. So it becomes very emotional and personal. Generally, whoever's more invested in the outcome of a business negotiation will get the worst end of the deal. We tend to only see the flaws in our own work. And this is great because it's what makes us improve our craft, but it's hard to value your own work when you know it could be better. Many of the most celebrated creative works actually lose money. One of the most famous examples of this is the anime for the movie Life of Pi. Rhythm and Hughes Studio was one of the most acclaimed animation and visual effects companies in the world. And Life of Pi was a worldwide blockbuster hit. But after Rhythm and Hughes Studio won an Oscar for their work in Life of Pi, they had to declare bankruptcy. Creators have been beaten down so much by society, by their teachers and themselves that they don't even see the value of their own work. They think it's normal to be able to do what they do because they're surrounded by it all day. I've had several instances where people try to give away design work to me for free, or they give it to me for an insanely low rate. To be fair, I don't know what their financial situation is. Maybe they're struggling to pay rent, so I wanna be mindful of that. But please preserve the value of your expertise and get a side job rather than charge low rates for your creative work. There's no shame in that. There also isn't any real support system for creatives, at least not any sort of formal one. If you wanna get feedback on your work or share it with other people, you're more than welcome to join my Discord, but otherwise there's no clear path unlike other fields like financial advisors, doctors, lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. If we take finance as an example, there are programs to set students up with jobs in big companies before they even graduate. It's also understood that recent graduates don't know very much, so they're mentored by senior members so that they can succeed. Meanwhile, the design and art path is just like, I don't know, man, try some art school and put yourself $100,000 in debt and hopefully it all works out. Designers not only have to be creative with the work that they do, they also need to be creative about how they make money from their skills. Established creative people tend to help the younger generation a lot less. It's a very zero sum mentality. This is essentially rooted in a perceived scarcity of opportunities plus massive egos in design. Creative people know that their contribution to society is really hard to measure or quantify, so they build up a big ego in order to make it seem like they're someone important. They're actually encouraged to put other creative people's work down. The thinking is that if you say everyone else's work is bad, it must mean that you have high standards and your work is really good. Senior designers, please stop doing this. Lots of people see right through it. It's just super cringe. The problem stems from something even deeper than that though. Most of the time, we simply don't fit in and we know it. I'll give you an example from my own life. When I was in second grade, the teachers would give students these little yellow star stickers for good behavior or completing an assignment or whatever else. The students would put the stickers on their desk as a sort of badge of honor. And the girl sitting across from me had like easily over a hundred of them all sort of in this neat little row. And almost all of the other students had a bunch of star stickers on their desks too. I think I had about seven. The person across from me had well over a hundred and I had seven. Look at all the stars you have. I'll never be that good. That was a very clear visual indicator to me. Like I just did not fit into this system and most creative people don't either. Society wants you to be a good little worker bee and most creative people are renegade killer bees. Creativity sometimes feels more like a curse than a gift. You can't escape your own thoughts and you want your ideas to be recognized, but a lot of the time, nobody cares. And that's not an easy thing to deal with. I know this sounds really negative, but I promise you'll be more optimistic by the end of the video. In order to address the problem, we need to understand it. Creativity isn't just forgotten in modern society, it's often maligned. Anytime you try to do something new or innovative, it's gonna be met with skepticism, ridicule, or even hostility. I mentioned this earlier in the video, but I wanna give you a specific example. My friend Rafi saw Prince live in concert in 1981. And at that time, Prince was an up and coming artist, but he wasn't nearly as famous as he is now. The audience didn't know what to make of him though. He was this androgynous black man wearing bikini briefs and a trench coat singing really explicit sexual lyrics. And he was singing his own unique blend of funk, soul, rock, R&B, and people just didn't really know where to place him. Was he Rick James? Was he Jimi Hendrix? Why was he dressed like that? And when people get confused about something new and creative, they ridicule it. And that's exactly what happened. The audience turned on Prince. This is actual audio from the concert. What you're hearing is a stadium of 94,000 people 
booing at one man in bikini briefs. They were throwing food, bottles, and shoes at him, and I can't even imagine how disappointing that must have been for Prince. I mean, he probably thought this was gonna be his big break, a chance to show the world his music, and he comes to find that everybody hates him and his work. What's most spectacular about this story is that Prince had the conviction and the courage to move forward anyway. He went on to become one of the most iconic musicians in modern history. One thing that people forget about Prince is that in spite of his outrageous lyrics and weird fashion sense, he's actually an incredibly talented musician. He played every single instrument by himself on his debut album, and he's a virtuoso guitarist. I think it's important to mention that because he wasn't all just about shock value. The thing is, he was very talented. He was super talented, but not all creative people are necessarily talented. Another inherent issue of creativity is that there's really no barrier to entry. This can actually be a really good thing because it's accessible to anyone and anyone can engage in it. But it can be a problem because anyone can call themselves an artist or a designer. Other professions are different because they have licenses or some sort of formal training. If you don't know about medicine, you go to a doctor, the valued expert there. If you can't fix your toilet, you call a plumber. But art, design, music, I mean, almost everyone can do some kind of creative work at some basic level. That doesn't mean it's gonna be good, but they can at least pick up a pencil and start drawing or bang on some drums or write a quick essay. Plus everyone wants to be creative on at least some level. That makes the quality of creative work vary widely. Overabundance of creatives along with serious lack of business training drives the prices down for creative work. If two people call themselves designers but one launched several successful products to the market and another just started tinkering around in Photoshop a few months ago, they're both designers, sure, but one is far more skilled. But on paper, they look identical. Another thing is that the uncertainty of creativity is what makes it exciting, but also exhausting. You just never know how your work is gonna be received. There's a song called Losing My Edge by James Murphy of LCD Sound System. In the opening line, he speaks the words, I'm losing my edge, the kids are coming up from behind, as you repeatedly get slapped in the face. What he's trying to communicate here is not exactly subtle. James feels beaten down and he's tired. At the time of writing this song, he's 37 years old and he's been trying to make it in the music industry for almost 20 years with no success. Every rejection is like a slap in the face. Younger, more talented artists are coming up from behind and he's just trudging through tired as hell. Ironically, this is one song that helped catapult his career as one of the defining artists of the 2000s. This is another example of an artist who had nothing to lose, so he took the ultimate risk by putting himself out there. Now, to be fair, Prince and James Murphy are just two people out of millions who have tried to make it. Almost none of us will ever receive worldwide recognition or acclaim. So, What's the silver lining here? First of all, presentation is everything. All great creatives understand showmanship, whether it's revealing an object that's actually cake, an iPhone unboxing, or an Issey Miyake fashion show. Presentation is everything. These Issey Miyake dresses are really cool, but they wouldn't be nearly as cool if they were presented as just a normal runway show. If you're watching this, you might be struggling as a creative person. We all do. Becoming a designer is by far the hardest thing I've ever done. I've had teachers, especially design professors, tell me that I'm not good enough pretty much my entire life. And some of them even told me I should drop out because I was wasting the rest of the class's time. People would underestimate me and they probably underestimate you too. I'm not a world famous designer and I probably never will be, but I have achieved a moderate level of success. I'm a design professor. I make these videos for you. I have enough client work to pick and choose the kinds of projects that I wanna work on, here's what I did, and maybe it'll help you. If you love your craft, just keep doing it. Don't stop. You can't control anything about how your work is perceived, but you can control the amount of work that you create. Here's another thing. A lot of people will make a design or a piece of art and sit around and wait for it to take off. Do not wait. You either actively improve on it or you move on to the next project. Don't overanalyze. Don't worry, just go back to work and find ways to do it better the next time. It will remove all of the anxiety you have around your lack of success. This also does two things. Number one, you're improving your craft. And number two, you're increasing your chances of someone recognizing your skills. You're a creator and creators create. Just like Prince or LCD Sound System, you need to press forward. Every artist and designer struggles with doubt even the biggest players in the industry. Think about how much we would have lost if Prince had stopped playing music after his terrible concert in 1981, or if James Murphy stopped recording albums before writing his song, Losing My Edge. It all boils down to courage. That's what my mentor Rafi tells me, and I agree with it 100%. I've come very close to quitting design entirely a few times, 
But every time I'm about to quit, I just go back to focusing on things that I find exciting and new, and somehow things just sort of fall into place. This YouTube channel is actually a great example of that. I never expected it to go anywhere when I first started it, but honestly, it's probably one of the best things I've ever done for my design work. If you're doing creative work for corporations or for money, you have to play by the rules of business. This video pretty clearly outlines the motivations of non-creative people and corporations. They want to reduce risk. So anytime you present creative work to an administrator, you have to look at it through that lens. If you do work for a client, it's likely that you have to compromise your vision in at least some way. And there isn't necessarily anything wrong with that. You should do what's best for your client or your patrons or your fans. Working for corporations can be really disappointing if you don't have another creative outlet. That's why I have my personal projects and my YouTube channel to experiment with new ideas that I wouldn't want to risk my clients money on. It keeps me ahead of the curve and forces me to constantly be exploring new ideas. You should be doing the same thing. Explore different ways of presenting your work, explore different methods of execution, just try new things constantly. I'm not saying that you need to start a YouTube channel necessarily, but you should always be going back to what made you excited about your craft in the first place. Explore new ideas and share them with others. Experiment with sharing your work in different ways. You don't have to share it on a massive scale. Sometimes it's enough to just share it with a few close friends. It's worth mentioning that I'm not just a designer, I'm a musician as well. And I've never made any real money from being a musician, but I've learned a lot about myself, I've learned a lot about the world around me, and I've learned a lot about other people through making music. Becoming a musician was probably one of the most enriching experiences of my entire life. There's value in creation for its own sake. There's nothing more life-affirming and courageous than the choice to create. It's the choice to make the world a little bit better, even if it's just for one person. Never forget that your work matters, even if it only matters to you. My good friend Rafi and I are writing an entire book on this subject, so if you enjoyed this video, go click the link in the description if you want to get notified of when it gets published. Have a great day, everyone. I hope you learned something.